So I want to start with these three images of coastal cities. The top one is New York. Uh, the middle one, what is that? Hong Kong, right? The bottom? Sydney, right? Okay, so these are familiar landscapes. Um, I want to point out that in each case, you have high density development that continues right up to the water's edge. Most of us think of that edge, the shoreline, as the boundary where the city ends. But today I want to challenge that idea, and I want to convince you that the city extends well beyond the shoreline into an expansive urban seascape that is densely populated with life. So nearly half of the world's population lives in coastal cities or developed coastal zones. This means that every day, hundreds of millions of people are walking by these seascapes. We're driving over them on bridges, we're riding over them on boats, yet it's not immediately clear to us that there is this vibrant seascape down below us. In part, this is due to the nature of water itself. Uh, the high density of water causes light to attenuate rapidly with depth, Urban waters are also notoriously cloudy because of coastal construction and dredging uh, and urban runoff. Um, so when you're looking into these environments, you really can't see very far into them. In addition, they are not the most glamorous environments to study. Uh, and until pretty recently, scientists really didn't know very much about these systems. So I'm a marine ecologist. Most of my colleagues have opted to work in picturesque places like coral reefs, and kelp forests and remote islands. And as a result, we know a tremendous amount about these types of habitats, but we know amazingly little about what lives at our back doorstep underwater in coastal cities. So this has been the focus of my research for the last six to seven years. Um, I wanna give you a bit of a tour of an urban seascape. For this, we're gonna travel to Seattle. Um, this is our dive buddy, Rhoda Green. She's standing in uh, the frigid water we're about to get into. And on this dive, it is going to be very short, but we are going to swim over to this dock that you see. So here we go. We're going down as the good divers that we are. We're going to go to the deepest area first. Um, and we come across some corrugated piping that somebody threw over, presumably after a construction event or something like that. Various things have made it their home. Here is a pile of tires that's inhabited by algae, uh, some fish, a few shellfish. And we've gone further. Here is the opening of a sewer pipeline. This is a decommissioned sewer pipeline, um, thankfully, because we're swimming through it. And you can tell there's all sorts of stuff that lives on the pipeline, including these uh, metridium anemones, also called plumose anemones. And the pipeline itself is covered in rocks to prevent erosion. So various things live in those rocks, like this fish, uh, like the scallop that you see here. So, like I said, a very short dive. It's time to go a little bit shallower. This is looking up at a jellyfish above us. This is a boat on its side uh, with a crab on it that is doing ballet. We're getting buzzed by a sea lion. And now we've gone on a little bit further and we are now at the base of the seawall that lines the shoreline. Um, you can see there's all sorts of stuff that grows here, various shellfish, algae again. Um, here are two sea slugs that are in love. This is their mating dance. It goes on for hours and hours. Um, and we've gone further. This is a patch of urchins. So those prickly, uh, spiky green things are urchins. They are voracious eaters. They eat everything in their path. And you can tell that they've been here for a little bit because uh, this used to be a beautiful kelp forest and they've, they've mowed it all down. I think we have a lingcod coming up here. This is my favorite fish for fish and chips, just in case you want to know. And it's time now to end our dive on our ascent. We're seeing some tube snouts on the way that are feeding in the water column. And we should have made it over to that fishing pier, which itself has a ton of life growing on it. These are uh, uh, tube worms and a little juvenile urchin there. And here's that jelly back at the surface. So we've completed our extremely short dive. So hopefully that gives you some sense of the types of structures that are down there. Um, but just in case, this is my terrible rendition of an urban seascape made with uh, free random clip art from the internet. Um, 
you can see some of the stuff we just saw, piping, tires, uh, various things. In addition to what we saw on our dive, there is a whole myriad of junk items, anthropogenic debris. By this, I mean things like um, cars that people drove off of docks, uh, refrigerators, toilets, bathtubs. Um, I've found all sorts of garden statues. Pretty much anything you can imagine is down there somewhere. And all of this material becomes habitat for a variety of different organisms, large and small. Um, so my research focuses on identifying what lives in these habitats and why, understanding how the species that are there interact with one another, and identifying the factors that shape biodiversity in these really urban settings. So let's start with one of the larger uh, inhabitants of these environments. This is the giant Pacific octopus. It is the largest known octopus species in the world. It stretches 10 meters or 30 feet from tip to tip when it's stretched out. In Seattle, in preliminary surveys, I was really surprised by the number of these I was finding in uh, deep, heavily urban areas. So I wanted to know, is this a real pattern, uh, or is it a figment of my imagination? This is the purpose of science, right? Uh, but it, figuring that out with an animal this large is actually quite challenging with traditional marine ecology techniques. So I relied upon data from the REEF program. REEF uh, is a program that trains citizen science divers to go out and collect information on um, the abundance of a variety of different species. And it provided me with information over a much longer time period and a much larger spatial scale than I would have otherwise had access to. So using that data um, and a series of statistical models, I found that indeed there is this pattern in deep habitats specifically, so 24 meters and deeper. Uh, in really urban places, you have a lot of octopus. Why might this be? Um, octopus are really great to study because they leave these piles of shells outside their den that you can collect and get a pretty good sense of what they're eating. So we did this across an urban rural gradient and we found that urban octopus and rural octopus are really eating pretty much the same thing. So it doesn't seem like food resources are driving this pattern we're seeing in their distribution. At the same time we did a series of video surveys um, in areas with a lot of junk and then nearby areas with not very much junk. Uh, so these surveys were done with an underwater camera with these lasers attached to the bottom. The lasers are at a fixed distance apart so you can measure what's in the frame because you know the distance between those points. Um, so it results in pictures like this. It also results in weird images like this robot which is actually a chassis on its side with the laser pointers that look like eyes. It's just one of my favorite photos so I include it. Um, but through this process we found that indeed it seems like it not, seems like there are more octopus in places where you have more junk. When there's not much junk, there are very few, if any, octopus present. So we think that this junk may be facilitating octopus in deeper urban settings. Let's talk about some of the smaller organisms uh, that live in these urban environments. So most coastal cities are positioned at the mouths of rivers or in estuaries where historically the dominant habitat type would have been sediment. Sediment is actually extremely diverse if you're willing to look at things under a microscope because everything is very tiny. So its inhabitants include microbes like the bacteria you see here, also a variety of worms. So this is a polychaete worm. It's about the size of your pinky nail from head to, to tail. And each of those terrifying jaws that you see is about the size of a grain of sand. So this is work that I did with uh, colleagues at the University of New South Wales. And we wanted to know whether different types of urban structures had a different effect on soft sediment organisms. Um, we went out and collected sediment in Sydney Harbor using this uh, terrifying claw-like thing that is called a Van Veen grab. You drop it off the side of a boat, it scoops up sediment, brings it back up, and then you can use it for various analyses. We used genetics and chemical techniques, chemistry techniques, and found that pilings in particular appear to be unique. So the microbial community surrounding pilings are different, is different compared to uh, the community surrounding other types of urban structures. And we found evidence that the food resources available to worms is different around pilings compared to other structures. So it's through studies like this and studies that many of my colleagues are doing in other parts of the world as well, um, that we are starting to form this picture. 
we're starting to find that the design of urban structure affects the biotic community that lives on the structure uh, itself. It also affects what lives in the adjacent habitats, and it affects the ecological processes that are occurring at the level of the seascape as a whole. So ultimately, these are ecosystems of our making, and it is entirely within our power to design them in a way that facilitates higher productivity and higher diversity. Um, to get there, though, we need to have a better understanding of the underpinning mechanisms that drive these ecosystems. And then we need to be innovative in the way that we combine science and design for coming up with solutions. So perhaps no one has done more on this front than my colleagues here in Singapore. I recently joined um, Dr. Peter Todd and Dr. Lynette Loke at the National University of Singapore, where they are studying seawall ecosystems and they are developing um, enhancement techniques for seawall habitats. So seawalls make up 63% uh, of uh, Singapore's shoreline currently. Um, when the tide is up, it's not a bad place to live if you're an organism like a snail or a calerpa algae or even a coral. But when the tide goes down and the sun is beating down on that rock and the temperature starts to skyrocket and any of the remaining moisture that was once there is evaporating, it becomes a brutal place for marine critters very quickly. Um, so Dr. Loke has been working on a series of tile designs that work to ameliorate these conditions for marine organisms. Um, essentially what she does is develop a, different tiles with different design features. She puts them out into the field, they become colonized with life forms over time, and she can come back, collect those uh, many months later, take everything off the tiles, identify what's there, and through an iterative process of doing this over and over again, she can identify the design features that maximize the diversity of species. So she's done this through several experiments. This is her most recent creation, the BioBoss 2. If you live in Singapore, you will hopefully start to see these soon around Changi Airport um, on the seawall there, and also around Palau Takong. There are 7,000 of them that are to be installed pretty soon. You may also start seeing them uh, in some other places around town, so keep an eye out. So we're making headway in Singapore. Um, and as we start to expand these enhancement techniques to, to begin operating at the level of seascapes, and also as we start developing uh, comparable technologies for other cities, it's really an exciting time to be in this field. But it's also a time for all of us to be re-envisioning what we want our relationship to be with urban seascapes. Maybe we want them to be accessible uh, to the public in the same way that a city park is. Maybe we want to design them so that they facilitate the types of species that we like to eat, the fish we like to eat perhaps, so that we can stop on the way home from work and fish and then we have our dinner. Um, or maybe we want to uh, design them so that they facilitate native species diversity at a time when marine diversity globally is on the decline. All of these things are possible, but it starts with redefining our boundaries and our perception of where the city ends. It starts with something as simple as pausing the next time you're at the water's edge and looking over the side to see what you find. You might be surprised. Thanks. <laughs>